Welcome to The Investing Show, where we discuss ideas to help you make more of your money. I'm Simon Lambert of This Is Money. And joining me on today's show, I have John Wallace, manager of Jupiter Green Investment Trust, and Richard Hunter of Interactive Investor. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hi, Simon. John, there's certainly been a renewed interest from investors in anything green uh, in recent years. There's also been a, a renewed interest from the investment industry in the concept of ESG. Um, but Jupiter Green is a is an investment trust that's actually there investing into companies that are doing things for the environment um, in lots of different ways. Do you target one particular sector or is it a, a broad based investment approach? And what's the sort of overall thinking behind what the trust does? Sure. Good afternoon, Simon. Hi there. Um, so Jupiter Green takes a, what we call a broad uh, multi-thematic approach but all of those themes that we have across the seven themes that we invest in <clears throat> are all environmentally focused in terms of looking for companies that have an environmental solution at the core of their business that includes uh, themes such as clean energy um, the circular economy which is how we basically use our resources more efficiently and change how we the, the, the types of materials that we use also energy efficiency sustainable agriculture nutrition and health that's a bit of a catch-all theme but an important one uh, and water and sustainable mobility as well. So, you know, really what we're looking for is our companies which have a solution at the core of what they do, really the beating heart of those businesses um, with a tangible solution to addressing big picture challenges. And obviously that's something that's very important, not just in the near future, but for the long-term future as well. And investors will know that this can be a, a very broad field. Um, sometimes they'll go digging into funds and see very well-known large established names and they might think what's that company doing for the, the environment but the managers might argue well they're in, improving the way that people operate within the environment do you aim for those for some of those bigger companies or are you looking more at smaller companies bringing new technologies through so we don't set out to, to target individual market cap sizes but, but we tend to find most of the opportunities in companies that where as i mentioned before they have a real focus on providing a solution enabling uh the transition to a sustainable economy um they tend to be smaller caps so smaller and mid cap relative to the you know the really large multi uh, mega cap companies more more um, more uh, more widely um so over history we tend to have a, a skew towards small mid cap um, over time, we expect that to creep up slightly, but for the near future, near term future, we expect the bias of the portfolio to be uh, certainly on small and mid cap solutions. Is that because, uh, sorry, Tommy, is, is that because um, larger sprawling companies tend to find themselves diversified into other things and, and therefore rather like biotech, I guess, um, it tends to be the smaller companies with specific focus on a specific area? Yeah, I think you're right, Richard. I think, you know, we're looking for companies which have, as I mentioned earlier, about 50% plus of their revenue. So really the core of the business in one or more of those seven things that I mentioned. So typically we find more opportunities in, in, in companies that are, because they're focused in those areas, in smaller mid-cap companies. Larger companies tend to be, I guess, more diversified, but over time we're finding that the, the investment universe is becoming more mature. So you know, we expect these companies to become large cap companies in time. And that's typically where we find the best value in, in companies which are going through an acceleration, if you like, um, in their development. They're rolling out the solution into the economy, which it needs to, to be rolled out, needs to be um, scaled up and quickly um, in order to meet, again, big picture, global, sustainable development goals. Um, but in the meantime, they are relatively small um, or, and, and mid-cap companies compared to the, you know, the real, the real large-cap companies globally. And does that mean that you're largely looking for growth companies um, within the portfolio? I think yeah, it, it's 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 a, a group of themes we're investing in which lends itself to growth. So I think again, you know, these are companies that have a solution that that, that should be scaled up quite quickly. Be it you know, clean energy, for example, as I mentioned, but also interestingly, in parts of the economy where we haven't seen a lot of of clear progress in terms of addressing the environmental issues within them. So we're seeing companies that have solutions for textiles, for example, solutions for building materials. Um, so away from the kind of traditional areas that people would associate with environmental solutions investing, such as clean energy and water, for example, and into other areas of the economy, which we were considered to be quite quite difficult 
to to tackle as a sort of a, a sector um, you know, catch-all term. But these are, these are companies that are providing a solution to parts of the economy that haven't really made much progress for one reason or the other. <clears throat> yes, because a lot of people, when they think green, they think renewable energy, don't they? Um, but it's it's a lot more than that, and that's a that's a part of the market that are, quite a lot of people are are into the renewable energy. There's a lot, of, a lot of investors chasing, you know, a limited amount of renewable energy. It's growing all the time, but there are other problems that the, the world faces, aren't there? And um, two that I've heard mention of time and time again are um, the clothing industry, um, textiles, and agriculture as well. Are, are those areas that you're particularly interested in, companies that can do something to solve problems there? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, just to put that into context, clean energy is a, is a as a theme within the portfolio is only about 15% of where we're invested. So, you know, that maybe surprises some investors or potential investors, given that we're not, you know, that's not a higher number. Um, whereas, you know, areas like the circular economy, where we find, as you mentioned, companies in the textile space um, is, is actually slightly more than that. So it's about 18% of the portfolio. So textiles, again, historically um, have got quite large environmental issues or challenges. So it takes about 4,000 litres of water to make a pair of jeans. That's according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. That's really, really water intensive. Uh, and obviously over time, that is, as the as textiles become um, more widely consumed globally and fast fashion kind of becomes more, more predominant, that impact is only going to go up. Also, an issue with textiles is that unsold garments at the moment go into either landfill or they get incinerated. Um, and structurally that's going to have to change. So in Europe in particular, the regulations now are seeking to address that so that by the midpoint of this next decade, companies won't be able to, to put waste or, or unsold garments into those, those two routes. They have to do something with them, so they have to be able to recycle them. So you know, we're finding companies, one in particular, where there's a clear solution where they can take that, that material waste, break it down, recycle it, and also recycle it into a product which can be then basically used again it's not being downcycled into something else it can be used back into the textile industry as a, as a new pair of jeans essentially so that's the sort of exciting part of what I do it's kind of looking for companies that are maybe slightly uh, you know away from the with the crowd um, and slightly off the off the beaten track and being focused on this area is obviously the advantage there we spend our you know our days day in day out looking for solutions in these types of areas so we're you know we're, we're all eyes and ears looking for those sorts of ideas. Yes, I was looking through your, your top 10 holdings, and I think the company you meant you're alluding to there is a company called Renew Cell. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, that's the one that works in the, te in the textile industry. In, in terms of some of the other companies in there and, and the type of things that they do and, and what makes you think that you know, you're, you're attracted to them, um, one of them uh, that uh, caught my eye was a company called Hoffman Cement. Is that correct? What, what, what's the cement company doing that is um, environmentally friendly? It's a good question. So, so cement. I mean, it's not a kind of traditional cement company. That's the beauty of it. But cement is a is a is a sector again, one of those areas where it has a huge environmental impact, mostly in terms of carbon. So the way we produce cement traditionally is is inherently carbon intensive, and that's why it accounts as an industry for about eight percent now of global carbon emissions. Um, and obviously, that number is set to rise given the progress we'll make in other sectors between you know, in the next, say, 5, 10, 15 years. So as energy is decarbonized, as cars on the road become electric, et cetera, that proportion of global emissions will only go up. So Hoffman Green Cement have a, a, a completely different way of, of producing cement. So as a result of that, it reduces the carbon footprint of the, the cement and the embedded carbon input of that, uh, also like embedded carbon impact of that, by a factor of five times. So it's not a traditional cement company, um, but um, I guess, as I mentioned, that's the, that's the point. It's seeking to deliver a, an alternative, um, still with you know, highly functional, uh, and over time will become cost competitive, but in, the, in you know, what it has in terms of its credentials are a clear environmental benefit. And I think regulation, but also um, consumer preferences potentially um, are, are likely to play a big role and driver in how that company can develop in the next five to 10 years. Are there any sort of unusual or lesser known themes emerging uh, in the massive universe that you're looking at that we might not have heard about, but where there are clear, clear green credentials coming through at the moment? Yeah, I think so. Agriculture, just to go back to, I didn't cover some of the points earlier in terms of the agriculture industry, but 
that's another one of those areas of the, the economy, if you want to call it the economy, that the way we, what we consume, how we consume it, where we need to address uh, the, the inherent environmental issues within that. But it's quite a difficult sector to, to tackle again. So if we think about meat and dairy, for example, um, again, that's a, a large contributor to global um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. We're seeing some solutions around the fringes of some of the companies that we invest in currently, whether there are already other solutions, environmental solutions, but they're, they're innovating around uh, feed additives, for example, that go into supply chains for cattle that reduce carbon emissions or methane emissions from, from cows by up to 40%. That's being rolled out um, potentially in, in New Zealand with a company called Fonterra. We don't invest in Fonterra, but we invest in the company that provides them with, with their, their feed additives that I mentioned. Another company that I, I noticed that you, you hold is a company called um, Tomra, Tomra Systems. What does that do? So Tomra is is probably a, a well known in in parts of Europe, parts of the US as well. Hopefully, we hope well, certainly in the near term we hope it's going to become well known in the UK as well. And what it does is um, it provides the machinery um, and the services that allow consumers to take back plastic bottles, glass bottles, and cans, for example, into places like supermarkets place those those cans into a into the machine and they get for that a, a consumer credit often for the store or just cash into their account and the reason why it's likely to become more more predominantly known is because it has about um you know, an 80 percent market share globally and the markets already have what they call a deposit return scheme so uh, whereby you, you you're charged at the point of buying a, a drink for example in a supermarket you're charged a, a flat level fee and you get that fee back when you take the, the packaging back to, to the store or to at any point where you can uh, drop off that, that packaging. So that's being rolled out at the moment or in the near term uh, in Scotland. And we expect that to happen in England uh, at some point in the next several years. Um, predominantly because, again, we have quite stretching targets to, to capture and, and prevent plastic waste from going into the environment. The only way we can really do that at scale to get it to the real the high numbers that we need to get achieved with that is through that sort of system so the company like a company like tom was is very well positioned to, to demonstrate i suppose to potential new markets that it's, it's one of the only ways that uh, a uh, a government if you like it that's seeking to reduce plastic going into the the the, uh, the environment can reach that level of recycling rate um on a consistent basis and Another company I was going to ask about as well, because it, I think it does operate in the renewable energy space, is uh, in your top 10 to a company called uh, Orsted. Is that how you pronounce it correctly? Um, yes. What, what's the attraction there within that renewable energy area with that company? So Orsted was uh, one of the, the very early first movers into the offshore wind space at scale. So there were lots of kind of relatively small companies going back 15, 20 years that wanted to get into that space. Also at that point was uh, Danish oil and natural gas. It was, it was Danish crown owned, uh, so partly state owned. Um, and it was going, undergoing a quite a quick transition away from offshore oil and gas, so a declining asset base and recycling the capital that it was getting from that uh, into offshore wind, which meant that they started to, at scale, to really push that market. So it was one of the big movers in the European market as that took off, certainly in the UK as well. Um, so a large market share there, but also it meant that it's gone globally to new markets a little bit sooner. So it owns a lot of the the rights to develop offshore wind in places like the, uh, the US, so offshore Massachusetts and New England. And these are assets that are now trading, changing hands for huge multiples of what they were previously um, bought for by the likes of Austin. So it's, it's sitting in a good position with all that operational experience as well of how to build and operate offshore wind turbines. It's also sitting on a, you know, a large pipeline uh, of potential development uh, globally, not just in Europe, where the market now is reaching some kind of maturity, but also in new markets, like I, I mentioned, the US being an example, Taiwan, uh, South Korea and Japan being others. And in terms of the, the trust, it invests all around the world, as you, as you explained earlier. Um, looking at the breakdown, it has a, a lower percentage in the US than the US makes up of the global stock market. We get so used to looking at um, global trusts and funds and just seeing, you know, 60% US, 70% US. Uh, it's about 30%, I think, for Jupiter Green. Is that because you, you're seeing um, better ideas coming out of other parts of the world? 
And do you think there'll be maybe more of a shift to the US in the future with the, the Biden pre presidency and the amount of money that he's, you know, promised to go into sort of environmental concerns? I think over time, it potentially will go up. Um, as you say, it's relatively low um, at the moment. It's not really, um, again, a reflection um, of anything against uh, the US market in particular. As I mentioned, like the likes of Allstead, a big part of their, their future growth is in the US. So they'll, they'll be a recipient and the beneficiary of, of the, the, the Biden administration. They're already, they're already seeing that change happening um, already in this early into his administration. So we, you know, we can play the, the, that kind of theme, if you like, that the, the growth in the US and the focus within the new administration um, on climate change, not necessarily through US companies or US listed or domicile companies, but also through, through, from companies list, listed in either Europe or Asia or elsewhere. Um, I think it's just a reflection at the moment, mostly of valuation. So we tend to find that uh, we can find better value in companies that are not listed in the US. It's quite a hot market for anything that has a sustainable solution to it or an environmental solution in particular in the US at the moment. Um, so we're more comfortable um, having invested in this space for a long period of time and knowing how these themes can play out uh, to find opportunities elsewhere outside of the US at this point. And there are also opportunities in some of the uh, major land masses, hugely populated areas where presumably the, the, they, must, they must be absolutely ripe for this kind of development. Obviously, I'm thinking mainly in, in terms of Asia. Um, is, is that somewhere that um, you've got any particular interest at all? It, I mean, it, it is. Again, it, in the same way that in the US, we, can, we have companies that have a solution that's being applied to the US market, but not necessarily local. Same thing is exactly the same uh, into to Asia as well. A big part of what, you know, where we find it interesting ideas is in areas like industrial automation, so energy efficient industrial automation, um, where the market potential in Asia in particular is very, very strong. Um, so not so many you know, uh, names that we invest in that are local uh, to those markets, but again, global companies uh, with global revenue streams and cash flows. And in particular, as I mentioned, the, the energy efficient, sorry, energy efficient angle in Asia in particular is really strong. That's a big focus for governments, certainly in China and in India as well. And closer to home, how about here in Britain? How how do we look on this on the scale of things? Do you do you find many exciting companies coming out of the UK, or or see any places where you think that looks like some interesting stuff is going to come out of there? I, I think we, we have a we do punch above our weight. Um, surprisingly, I think um, it's it's often misconception. Maybe that the UK is falling behind, um, but actually the UK was a an early mover into areas like offshore wind. It does have companies um, that still have um, some good exposure there, um, but also in 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 new technologies. So um, there's a couple of you know we have two percent, a very small percentage of the portfolio, but two percent in the hydrogen economy through a UK listed company. It came out of one of the, the London universities here. Um, and it's partnering up with global organizations. Um, so um, basically vehicle manufacturers, engine manufacturers who are looking to shift to sustainable ways of doing things in the long term. Um, so actually in some areas, pockets of innovation, you know, we do have a very strong track record and good companies uh, that, that we're finding good value at this point. Um, and just finally, before we end, a, a question out of personal interest, actually, because I, the one thing that makes me a little bit sad about the, um, the the greening of the economy is the loss of the petrol engine car eventually, because I do love cars, but um, I like an electric car as well. They, they do drive very well. But from your professional point of view, when you look at the, the question of, um, you know, the internal combustion engine, cars, motorised transport, whether it's cars, vans, lorries, whatever, is it... Are we, is the world set on electric now, do you think? Or is uh, hydrogen going to come through? Or even we're hearing talk of e-fuels and Porsche is putting a lot of money into e-fuels at the moment. Do you think that's it? We've made a commitment globally to electric cars and, and, and that's the way forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there was a, probably a period about 10 years ago where there were multiple solutions, be it hydrogen, electric, battery electric vehicles. To some extent, I also plug in hybrids. So you know, mild hybrids, etc. Um, and it wasn't quite clear what the medium term and long term would look like. I think at the moment, we're much more uh, geared towards, uh, sorry, excuse the pun, but much more geared towards um, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. The reason for that is companies that have been, have come out of nowhere, 
effectively come from outside of the industry and are now building uh, plants in th you know across three continents. Um, these aren't you know, the obvious banner name there is not one that we hold, um, but it's had a huge profound impact on the wider um, kind of ecosystem, but so that the competitors in the automotive space. And that's why you're seeing the likes of say VW effectively double down on battery technology. Um, it doesn't mean that that's the technology which is going to dominate across all parts of the world um, in, the, in the long term. I still think there's an opportunity, certainly for hydrogen in, in, in heavy duty vehicles in particular, less so for light vehicles, but certainly, yeah, so passenger cars and light vehicles. I think the, the next 15 to 20 years looks likely to be dominated uh, by battery electric vehicles. Okay, well, John, thank you very much. That was uh, very, very interesting. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Richard, thank you for joining us. Sure. And um, thank, you, thank you all for watching as well. See you next time on The Investing Show. Goodbye. <laughs>